Hi, my name's Mike Brady. I'm the founder and illustrator from Liner Designs and Illustration. This is my first YouTube video and it's really good to, uh, to meet you all. Today I wanted to talk to you about the Lusitania. I recently finished illustrating it and today I wanted to give you a guided tour around some of the interesting points of the ship and some things that I learned while I was drawing it. So, let's have a look around. The poop deck here is a little different to uh, what some of us have come to expect from certain white starline ships that shan't be named. In the way that there's not really a well deck. This was one continuous deck, it was a promenade um, that ran all the way forward. So it was flush with the hull as opposed to where you would typically have a, a, a sort of ha cargo handling area or a well deck with cargo hatches and things. Uh, White Star Line was really guilty of this but you've got whole towers devoted to classes. So of course first class has this fantastic great whopping section of superstructure that's like three quarters of the length of the ship. And then second class has its own tower further off. We'll come back to that in a minute. Looking at the poop deck here, you've got all the machinery that falls under probably the warping or mooring category of uh, deck equipment. You've got um, steam capstans, you've got fair lead rollers and what have you. You've got a, a fairly large steam winch here. One point of interest is this little skylight here. That leads right down into the, uh, the depths of the ship from where the steering gear compartment was. That would operate the rudder. That provides ventilation and air. It was really important because the way that the rudder was operated was through a, a miniature steam engine, really. A reciprocating steam engine similar to those that might be found uh, powering, not this ship because she was turbine driven, but other steamships like, I hate to say it, Titanic. Another thing that's fairly Lusitania-y and I wanted to capture it in my drawings is camber. Um, camber is the degree to which a ship um, sags, for want of a better term, in a sectional direction. So if you take a ship and you cut it up like a loaf of bread, you're going to see that a lot of these decks that are exposed to the elements aren't actually dead flat, they slant downwards by a fraction of a degree. And this is to help water um, from accumulating and drain it down into the scuppers and out of the side of the ship. And you see this a lot in things like the docking bridge here, where you can actually just see it sloping downwards. There's one photograph of the Baltic, this old white star liner that looks like it was left in the sun a little bit too long and melted. Camber became slowly less and less severe, if you will, as shipping technology uh, progressed. But in those early days, it was really evident. You're going to see that a little further forward as well. This is a really interesting little thing. This was called a night life boy. This was fairly popular as a device on late 19th century pre-dreadnought warships, especially in the French Navy, but also in the British Navy. Essentially how it worked, you've got uh, a hollow structure made out of steel tubing, so fairly lightweight. And part of it, I'm not entirely sure which part, but part of it was coated in a magnesium mixture so that when it landed on contact with water would light up. So in theory, if someone goes overboard at night time when previously they'd be in trouble, um, this device could be deployed, it'd light up on contact with the water, and someone could swim out to it and cling on, maybe be uh, rescued by the ship. I don't think it really took. I don't think it really took. I don't know that it was ever used. Um, in fact, it's kind of sad, but nowadays a, a few people every year actually disappear at sea on cruise ships. Um, it's a problem that's never really been solved, but people do still disappear, so uh, don't go overboard. It's not fun. This is another uh, skylight and ventilator here. Um, this one was recently identified on the wreck, which is significant because there's really not a lot on the wreck of the Lusitania that's identified. In fact, Lusitania's structure was covered in ventilators and skylights, and from the inside it's beautiful. You have these spectacular tall rooms that are capped with a, with a glass skylight. This is another interesting thing. The Lusitania <laughs> existed in an era where promenading was one of the few things that you could do at sea. They, of course, they didn't have any floating casinos or, uh, or theatres or what have you, so um, walking around at sea on deck was a really important thing and when, when, you're in, uh, when you're in rough weather you still want to be able to do it. So Cunard and a lot of other passenger lines at the time went to a lot of effort to make sure that in rough weather whole sections of the deck that would otherwise be exposed to the elements could be screened off with canvas. So you get these really complex awning structures. This one at the stern is probably the most interesting. It looks really, really complicated. I haven't seen any photographs of it in use yet. You see a lot of this in ships like P&O's, Multan, similar ocean liners of the 1910s, 15s and 20s that were sent to tropical climates where maybe the passengers from uh, England and Europe weren't so used to being exposed to sun. My dad tells me this story. He came out to Australia in 1959 on the Strathnaver, which was this old 1930s P&O ship. And a couple of passengers were sunbathing, young men in their 30s, and died at sea because they weren't so used to uh, to the heat, and they died of sunstroke. And they had to be buried at sea, um, even in the 1950s, the late 1950s. Go figure. I like uh, the way that Cunard, uh, or 
I guess John Brown went about um, warning people about the propellers. They didn't just go for a you know slapping a board on the side. You've actually got almost this uh, three-dimensional effect because one's slightly raised forward and one's slightly raised aft, which I think is a nice touch. Curiously though, they only align with the forwardmost set of propellers, not the aftmost set. So you might be excused for thinking this was a uh, twin screw ship. And you wouldn't want to end up here as a tugboat captain. My father was looking for the Holy Grail, did you kill him too? That's a good one. Down here we've got um, two sets of uh, inlets, if you will, and outlets. So in this case you've got two massive openings that lead straight into the pump room. So this was for drawing in huge amounts of uh, seawater. And then you also get the condenser discharge outlets from here. So the turbines are obviously taking a lot of steam. Um, condensing that, taking the energy out of it, and what you're left with is, of course, a lot of, uh, a lot of fresh water. And there's only one way to get rid of it. Some of it gets recirculated into the ship, the rest of it goes out the side. The cargo cranes, early in her career, Lusitania only had two uh, cranes for cargo handling aft here. But at some point, um, before 1910 at the very least, um, even probably earlier than that, they were uh, they were supplemented by a second pair. So these two little structures where the cranes would eventually sit were originally deck stores. Um, they probably held deck games, I'm going to say. You do actually see photographs of uh, shuffleboard being played in this area. I'm going to say it was probably stored in there. Moving along, this is, uh, this is kind of a funny thing, but of course we were talking earlier about how you had whole towers, if you will, superstructure towers, dedicated to individual classes. Which is kind of a cool idea, but also results in these awkward situations, I suppose, for crew. Say you have to get down here to the docking bridge, from the bridge at the forward part of the ship, you're a crew member. There's no real comfortable way of getting there apart from descending a bunch of stairs and then climbing a whole lot more. So, the solution that's come up with is to install two gangways on either side of the mast so that crew can access either side of the ship. I don't know, it's kind of inelegant and a bit silly looking, but it's not as bad as Normandy. Normandy had this almost last minute screen. It looks like uh, it's a wooden partition installed on the, the deck. It's not really in the plans, I couldn't find it, but the way that they decided to um, discern that this was first class and this is second class was by installing a giant, tall, wooden bulkhead partition with a door for crew to go between. Really inelegant, also extremely impractical. I can imagine these things being ripped off during storms. I would be surprised if they weren't at some point during her career. Uh, I, love, I love all this clutter. There's so much, so much detail going on here. This is a cool little detail here that almost escaped me the first time I, uh, I drew this, but this seems to be a device for securing the funnel shrouds to the deck, providing tension and flexibility. You've got these funnels that are say 50, 60, 70 feet tall. They're riveted to the deck plates, but of course they need support, almost like a, the, the cables on a bridge. You know, in rough weather, it's important to ensure that there is actually a degree of flexibility because as the funnel is swaying from one side to another, you hate to uh, have a situation where the shrouds might snap and come crashing back down on the uh, on the deck. Nobody wants that. So these devices here provide the tension to make sure that the funnel is uh, always supported and under tension on all sides evenly. But it's a great idea. These ventilators here are probably the most important, this whole uh, section. These go straight down into the turbine rooms. They, uh, they provided access to the turbine rooms from the deck and they also provided light and ventilation for the engineers down there. Really important. You can only imagine what that would have been like standing right at the top and looking down 10 stories right out into the depths of the ship. Really cool. So this is a really nice detail. It's not evident from the exterior, but sitting right in here is the first class smoking room. And on top of it, you've got a massive glass skylight. But just to the right of these, a little forward further of the ship, you've got two big drum slash barrel type ventilators that go down into the galley. But forward of this, you've got a pipe leading straight into the fourth funnel. Now people like to say the fourth funnel on a lot of these liners was uh, dummy. This is a popular misconception in the way that true. They didn't vent gases and smoke and, and uh, fumes from the boilers, but they serve really important purposes as far as providing ventilation and in this case, providing an escape for smoke from a pair of fireplaces in the first class smoking room. Actually, this is a, again, really Lusitania-ish, but I just love these exposed switch boxes. You just have these sitting out there exposed to the elements. This is an important one. There's not a lot on the Lusitania today that is recognisable as once being part of the ship. There's a lot of small pieces here and there, like capstans and what have you. But there's not a lot of areas where you can definitively say, oh yeah, that's Lusitania. But this is one rare exception. This is the base of the first funnel. 
Today, still relatively intact, you can pick out a lot there. One of the things that for a long time served as a marker for divers going down on the ship and using this as a orientation point was these three water tanks. Fresh water for drinking, salt water, and condensed water. These tanks, I think, have since rusted away. These pipes are really similar to those seen on the funnels of the Olympic class liners, but essentially gravity is providing water pressure so that um, when you turn the tap on, water will actually come out. It provides pressure for the entire system. Pretty cool. This is one of those details that remind me that Lusitania was, was really an early four stacker. But um, the way that the bridge is connected to the whistles on the forward funnel, it, it's just a pulley system. That's all it is. From what I can see, you had two rollers installed on the funnel sides, on either side. The way that you would engage the foghorns and the whistles is by pulling on that cable. It's rudimentary, but it works. We talked earlier about the camera of the ship. This is another place where it's really evident. You can see the, uh, the bridge wing cab sloping down there. It might have been a little bit uh, sadomasochistic of Cunard, but they installed the bridge wing cabs there as, as open. It wasn't too long ago that the entire bridge of an ocean liner, especially Cunarders, was completely open. They had no, uh, no enclosure whatsoever. That, was, that must have been a pretty tough time. You've got two skylights here. These are really important. One of them looks down into the wheelhouse, uh, provides natural light, but the other one looks down into the officer's smoking room. You can see it in photographs. It would have uh, provided some really nice light. Lastly, her name picked out in uh, polished metal. I think it was bronze. And these were uh, riveted or bolted straight onto the side of the ship. And she was a beautiful ship, you know. The Cunardas, uh, especially the Lusitania and the Mauritania, look like they were built for speed. You have to love them. You can see why they were called Greyhounds of the Atlantic. Well, that's it from me. I hope you enjoyed my first YouTube video. Please like, subscribe, and comment. I'd love to hear your feedback. I'll probably do another one of these videos for another ship. Maybe the Olympic or something. I don't know. What would you like to see next? You can see my entire catalog at linerdesigns.com. I'll provide the link. Until the next video, stay safe, stay happy, and thank you for joining me.